I'm gonna be back early. Are you guys gonna be all right? We're gonna be fine. Daddy time. Being away from family is easier when you still feel close to home. With Xfinity Home, you can stay connected with remote access and feel protected with 24-7 professional monitoring with fast response time. Xfinity Home. Connected. Protected. Home. Call, go online, or visit today. And that means all of you. <laughs> Put those phones on silent. Hey, are you guys ready to be blown away today? And I mean that in the nicest way. Yes? Welcome to our conversation, Hollywood Weapons. And we have two gentlemen up here who are dying to talk to all of you. So uh, say hello to them, warm them up, you know, get them, give them a mile high welcome here, can you? Okay, so you know in all relationships, there's a balance of that free-spirited dreamer, maybe the voice of reason. <laughs> I think you'll figure out in due time who wears that voice. Where's that voice? Who has that voice? No, you're not allowed to talk just yet. You just hold on because we're going to ask you questions. These two guys are the hosts of this show, Hollywood Weapons. It's a great show. They're like two little boys playing with firecrackers in their backyard. Um, they just take it to the next level. So we want to show you a clip so you can get an idea, and then we will start asking some questions. May the Lord have mercy on his soul. Proceed. Smile, you son of a... Kaye, mother I'm Terry Shepard. I know who you are. I know all the badasses in this neighborhood. <laughs> As a U.S. Army Green Beret medic, sniper, and close combat specialist, I've been tested most of my life. I'm here to put Hollywood to the test. The good, the bad. We definitely have the ugly. My good bad. Way. Welcome to the party, pal. He's gonna get hurt. And that, my friend, is how you blow up a shark. I couldn't do it again. I look really good in the wetsuit. Too much information. <laughs> what did we learn today? We're going to need a bigger boat. Can you really do that? What the heck is this? This is Hollywood Weapons. This is Hollywood. We make the impossible happen. So how does it all happen? Well, we have Larry Zanoff and Terry Shepard here with us today to give us some, uh, some idea of how they pull these shows off. So gentlemen, thank you for being here, first of all. Our pleasure. Thank and you, our um, pleasure. give us your background first. First? Yeah. He actually, he really does love me. He's acting like he doesn't. This is our relationship. Uh, so my name is Terry Shepard. I was a, uh, I, had a, I had a degree in anthropology from University of North Carolina. Uh, in my junior year, I was reading a book about the Green Berets in Vietnam, and I, I read it cover to cover, and I shut the book, and I thought, that's what I'm going to be. And it wasn't because what uh, the stories about what they did, it was the pictures of these dudes uh, coming out of the bush, sweaty, exhausted, black guys, white guys, with um, the Montagnard uh, 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 tribes people that they were doing all these missions with. And what impressed me about these black and white pictures was these guys were smiling, and they had obviously just cheated death. So... When I saw the pictures of these men, I thought, that's what I want to do. So I got my degree. I enlisted in the Army. I was an 82nd Airborne guy, scout. I went to Ranger School, uh, Panama, training the Gulf War, the first Gulf War. And when I got back, I tried out for the Green Berets. I made it. I lived in Germany for about four and a half years as a Special Forces medic in 10th Group. I got out in 97, went back to New York City, went to classical theater school, basically got an MFA in acting, and I was doing theater in New York and TV and stuff, and then 9-11 happened. So I was like, do I go on auditions or get back in the fight? An easy call for somebody like me. So I re-enlisted into National Guard Green Berets and was deployed immediately. I'd go away on a combat tour or a training mission, come back, 
was doing theater, TV, and then I ended up getting a show called uh, Warriors on History Channel. I did Shark Week in 2010, a bunch of survival stuff. And all the time I'm doing this shenaniganry, I was on a Special Forces A team, and the last five years of which I, I was in charge of it as a team sergeant, and I retired in October 2016, so about a year ago. And it worked out great, so the day of my retirement, I was with Larry and our team uh, filming at Gunsight in Arizona, so I walked right from one team and one project into another. So here we are. It's a kind of a, I was telling you, this, the show for me is a boy's dream. I mean, I get to do stuff that I did in the Army, blow stuff up, which is fun. It's always fun. Shooting guns, fun. Um, and also I get to work with great guys. And I'm a, you know, I'm a movie geek and a TV geek, so I get to play these characters and then see if you can make that shot and with that gun. we have a, a voice of reason. Well, amongst, the, the, amongst the duo here. So I'm the child, so, I'm the 10 year old, and this is the adult in the room, so. So Larry, give us, give us uh, some of your background. Well, I'm the adult in the room, evidently. Um, at a very, very young age, I uh, left the United States at four years old. And my family moved to Israel. Uh, I grew up there, spent uh, several years in the military during the 1980s uh, Lebanon War. Uh, came back to the United States, wanted to become a gunsmith found out that it was a lot more expensive to go to gunsmithing school than they told you. So I worked for several years in law enforcement and private security, uh, finally graduated from a gunsmithing college, got a job in the, in the firearms industry in California, and in about five years, the California assault weapon ban put my company out of business. So at that point, I started working in Hollywood. Uh, I've been doing that for about 20 years and I'm fortunate enough to be able to use all that gun knowledge in, uh, in a way that hopefully brings entertainment and pleasure to other people. So this show airs on the Outdoor Channel. How, what did you first think when the Outdoor Channel said, hey, we want to do this show? Yeah, so I, you know, a couple of years ago, well, a couple, God, time goes by too, and that's, I used to have more hair. But how's my hair today, by the way, is it okay? <laughs> yeah, your one hair's fine. Nice, nice people here. Um, so, just kidding. So a couple years ago, I did a thing for Outdoor Channel. We always, uh, always wanted to work together again. And uh, when they proposed the show to me, I didn't, you know, I didn't know Larry yet. My first thought was, so what's separating this from Mythbusters? It's kind of more of a straight down the line. Let's test this gun under those conditions. And so <clears throat> I was excited to do it because Outdoor Channel is really, they're great people to work for. But the show is kind of morphed now where they've let us have free reign. I hope they still don't regret I that. I don't let they, him have they, free yeah, reign. But, uh, <laughs> So we, we've played up a lot more of the, I, I think Larry and I's relationship, the, the kind of buddy comedy thing where I'm always kind of messing with him and he's, he's coming along, uh, but he saves the day. And then also I get to play these characters. And so it's, it's changed. Uh, I like to think for the better and that it's just a, it's a more, it's, it's a broader show. I think, I think you'll, you'll have fun. I mean, if you like guns, you'll like it. If you like TV and film, you'll like it. If you like learning about special effects. How did you two get together on this show then? Why you two? I don't, I don't, what, what do you think about that, man? I don't know. You know, um, I had been fortunate enough to work with uh, Wintercom on several other shows, uh, Gun Stories, Shooting Gallery. Um, we had provided the armory service for those shows, and I think they just uh, saw our business as a, as a good starting point for Hollywood weapons. Um, once Terry and I met, um, I think we kind of clicked. Yeah, it was just one of those chemistry. things. Just the, 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 the funny, sarcastic comments were, were, were fly, but... I'll say this about Larry, you know, he was, he always downplays his combat experience and what he did in the, uh, in the IDF, but this is the kind of guy who would have made a perfect Green Beret. Uh, he's smart, he plans ahead, he's looking out for the team, and uh, he's got a passion for it. So I also want to say, give credit to Danny Ram, uh, the creator, really, of the show and, and, and the writer. He's, he's amazing. Like, he, he gets how we work now, and without, I mean, the way he writes these things, it's, I feel like it's the way, we're just the way they way make too the show. Fun. They really do. They they mold it around us. They've kind of let us go with it. I think. Yeah. Well, and Larry, and you were always a behind the scenes kind of guy, right? So what was it like then to to make that transition? Well, you know, I've done some in front of the camera stuff, interviews and things like that for for larger movies. Um, the stressful part for me about this show, of course, it's all live fire. It's it's not blanks. It's <laughs> not a movie set. Um, and although I co-host with Terry, I also do all the armory work behind the camera. I'm the head safety officer behind the camera. I have to figure out how to do all these challenges safely. And the cool part about that for me is that I'm working with Terry because when I give him a gun, 
He may not be familiar with it or whatnot, but I know he's not going to do something stupid with it because he's a Green Beret. He yeah. knows what he's doing. He respects the weapons. When I tell him to do something, he does it. And I think we, we pull it off pretty well on, on most occasions. Let's talk about the pilot, Criminal Minds. That pilot was shot in February of 2016, looks at a scene from so Criminal Minds, yeah. tested wow. an underwater scene shooting a Glock. So with that being the pilot, were there any safety concerns, I mean, right off the bat? Well, there's always, there's always yeah. safety concerns when you're dealing with anything live fire, first of all. But that was, of course, underwater. Uh, we all know the, the, the laws of physics. You can't compress water. So the shock wave is very much contained. And having Terry inside of a very small tank with that shock wave reverberating off the walls is, is kind of dangerous. I knew it was going to suck. I knew it was going to suck. Gonna yeah. suck. I mean, I'm um, in fact, there's one clip there that I think we'll see a little later where you see him pop right up out of the water going, I couldn't do that again. You know, so, uh, so we're you always concerned about, you know, his hearing, stuff like that, especially when it was underwater. Um, the logistics anyway. of it, you know, yeah. uh, is difficult. But um, safety is always the number one thing. We wouldn't put him in a bad situation we knew, or we, the rest of the crew. Yeah, we knew it was going to, I mean, it, it, water, I'm a scuba instructor too, so you, water just transfers. That's why if you guys are ever underwater and a boat is somewhere nearby, you can't really tell where it's coming from, right? Because the sound gets to you so much faster that to delineate where it's coming from, you all, you're kind of looking up, looking around. So water is an excellent uh, uh, medium to transfer energy to include you know, ballistic energy or shock, you know, and, and, and in a closed environment too. So I basically pretended I was doing a demolition, like I was doing an interior breach on a building. I just kept my mouth open when I shot because I knew that stuff would, it, it thumps you, it actually can do something. But we set, we knew what we were doing and it still sucked, but it was fun. And, we, and yeah. were you really thinking that that was the episode that was going to really hit for people? I mean, really interest people since you were dealing with Water well, yeah, it, you know, and it's funny, we were sort of talking before about the, the, the pilot was, was, was probably the most, is the least like any other episode because well. it relied less, we had just, that was the first thing we boring, did. It was boring, okay, <laughs> the pilot was boring. <laughs> I just didn't and get by to play the characters I wanted to. By episode two, you know, we had him dressed up as Clint Eastwood, and it got better, okay? Anytime Terry plays dress up, pilot. it's a lot more fun. Yeah. Playing dress up is a lot of fun. It's, it is. Don't judge me. Don't, 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 don't even, don't look at me weird. So that's, got, that's, all come, that's all come along the way. So the pilot was good, but the pilot was kind of just the initial template start. And then once they realized, hey, we have something here with these jamokes, and, and we can push in this direction, Danny, uh, the writer, we all we are on the same page, and so now it's. I think the show's better because I think you're going to get more laughs out of it. I think that's important. So, how has the show developed then, since it's it's not like the pilot any longer? Well, go, yeah. I, I mean, what do you I think? I think the original pilot it was a very dry kind of MythBusters testing uh, kind of show, uh, but I think it's actually evolved evolved into more of an entertainment show. You learn a little bit about the weapons, you learn a little bit about how you make movies and television work, but it is entertaining. There's humor in it, Terry gets dressed up, we make fun of him, it, it works. I, what's, what's with you in the wigs, by the way? Don't, okay, first of all, I don't have any hair, so I'll do it anytime I can take a wig, I'll do it. And you know, we're coming up, one of the things I'm excited about too, we're gonna be doing an underworld test, so I'm gonna be dressing sort of like Kate Beckinsale. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At, at my suggestion. Uh, so the point is we have, it's fun, man. I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I've done a lot of TV, as I told you, and I, I was a classically trained actor. I, I've learned the lesson over time that it, I think a lot of guys that get into TV or film now that are uh, military guys, they make a mistake. They're way more interesting than I am. They've got more combat experience than me. But I think a lot of guys, when they get in front of the camera, they sort of put on this sort of stoic face which is I think they're giving you what they think you expect them to be. And I think that always falls flat. I think the, the cool part about anything on film is if you're vulnerable. And that's a weird word for, for guys like us. But if you can look, if you, I'm not afraid to fall on my ass. I'm not afraid to make mistakes. Um, and uh, I think that's, I've learned that over time that don't try so hard, just be you. You're, you're, everybody out there is more interesting than anything you think you can create. And he definitely likes being a character. Yes. Which we have video proof of. So let's uh, roll the let's tape. On this episode of Hollywood Weapons, we're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> Pull up a chair. Have a drink. Hey, welcome to the party, pal. 
Take us out of orbit, Mr. Clark. What course would you like me to set, sir? Pick a star. Let's see what's out there. Wig. Bond. James Bond. No, it's just me. All right, we're testing 007. You're welcome. Sure. Come to California. We'll have a few laughs. I was watching a TV show, and this guy shoots a Glock underwater, and the bullet goes through a windshield, and I thought to myself, come on, can you really do that? Not today, fake snake. <laughs> Trust me, I would have rather gotten a flight, but putting this stuff on a plane, hassle. This episode of Hollywood Weapons, we're putting Quigley down under to the test. I told you we would listen to you. This episode on Hollywood Weapons, we're putting Predator to the test. Stick a Hollywood. This episode of Hollywood Weapons, die hard. Well, this one's gonna really roast his chestnuts, because on this episode of Hollywood Weapons, we're testing reindeer games. He's cool, I'll take one more. This episode of Hollywood Weapons, we're testing Justified. I'm Captain Terrence Patrick Shepard, and on this episode of Hollywood Weapons, we are going out of this world to test Star Trek. People with ropes around their neck don't always hang. Is that true? We're gonna find out on this episode of Hollywood Weapons. I get paid to be an idiot. Yeah, you don't like that and at all. And you do, do it you? well. And I do it well. <laughs> so much fun, man. Come on. Which is your favorite? I mean, yeah, I, obviously I, you're having a good time. Yeah, well, I th I, come on. If you don't have a good time, uh, what's wrong? You know what I mean? If I, I, I saw, I, sometimes in the middle of filming, we'll just go, hey, guys, uh, reality check. No one's getting shot at, you know, and uh, we're making a TV show. So um, I think I, I like all of them. I mean, I, these are all, the, all these movies and TV shows I grew up with, and... To get a chance to um, to get to, to, to play some. I'm waiting cats. for the Underworld episode. Well, the Underworld one, I, I just <laughs> I, 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 have, I just have I just can't even sleep at night thinking yeah, about Kate. But um, but it's also the other thing too is we've we've also gotten to interview. We've got the real pleasure. It's quite an honor to meet and interview people uh, that are in these movies. So like if you know Predator, uh, Bill Duke, the huge tall black guy that was just this iconic character. He he was so gracious. We had a great interview. He was, we were talking about the minigun thing. He was, he's amazing. You were kind of drooling talking to him. Yeah, oh, because he, he's, it's Bill Duke and he, he can't be nicer. And a couple weeks ago, I interviewed Tom Selleck, who is a very gracious guy. Uh, it's Monday, I guess, when we go to Burbank tomorrow. But Monday, I'm interviewing Gary Sinise, because um, he, he's in that movie Ranger Games where he tests the, uh, the shotguns. So that's a part of it, too, I think. Of, as we continue to do the show, I think it's important because it's called Hollywood Weapons. No one cares about me. But if you have Tom Selleck or Gary Sinise, then, then now you have the Hollywood and weapons. And so that's, that's a lot of fun, too. And to also get their background or their perception. Uh, uh, what's the word I want to use? Their, their inside view of, like, when they were filming. Like, when Bill Duke was talking about when they were in Mexico filming Predator. That was yeah. really interesting, you know? A lot of the backstory. I, you know, I know there's a lot of antics on the show, but really, ultimately... Your job is to keep him safe. How do you how do you do that? How do you how do Lots you of sleepless balance? Nights. You know, um, it is it's tough. You know, if you've been on a, a large budget Hollywood film production, it looks like organized chaos, but it's actually a very very controlled environment. Here, you know, we're doing things for real. It's a lot harder to control it. Right. Um, if you watch the original Die Hard, you know. Poor Bruce Willis is running around barefoot and his feet are all cut up and that's all fake. <laughs> but here he's running up the stairs shooting a firearm with real hot shells coming out of it. and He's doing it barefoot. So there's a lot of planning, a lot of logistics, and not a lot of rehearsal actually. No, not, not too Just much. Just kind of a lot of talk throughs of what exactly um, we're going to do, how we're going to accomplish it. And then we pull the trigger. That's gun guy humor, by the way. We pull, pull the, the trigger. trigger. Get it? Anyway, um, that was bad. Huh? I thought it was funny. <laughs> I thought it was funny I too, thought, but you know, I, it worked for um, me. But here, here's the one thing that's really important about this show that uh, that I think makes it different. Let's say from you know, um, MythBusters is when not to this Myth, MythBusters or anything, but when I watch one of their shows, especially one of the firearm shows, I could tell that the test was kind of specifically slanted in a certain direction. I already knew what the outcome would be. 
Okay. Here we're doing all of the testing for real. Yeah, we don't we go, fake it. We go into it. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't fake it. Now that causes our director John Carter to have some sleepless nights as well, because he doesn't know what's going to happen. He's right here in the front row, by the way, and he's one of your local boys. So Yay. we should give him a hand yes, there. Yes. Yes. But have yes. you had um, any any real scares? I, if we did, if we did, we would never You're tell you. Telling. No, come on. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'm scared Admit every nothing, time I get onto set with him. Admit nothing, um, deny everything, make counter accusations. Yeah. That's the Green Beret way. By the way, Mitch, where's Mitch Utterback? Is he out there? That's one of my great friends. He's another uh, hero in your midst. He's a, a Green Beret brother of mine. He came up to see this. So that's cool. It's good to see him. You know, I think I, at least me personally, I have concerns every single yeah, time we do a I agree, test. I agree. And we do, yeah. Every time I step on the set, whether it's this show or any other show, I'm only happy when we lock the guns up, we're all driving mm -hmm. away, we got the shot that we wanted, nobody got hurt, and everything worked correctly. Um, there are some that are a little bit more worrisome than others, and I think we have a clip here of uh, one from season two, actually, which we could go ahead and Let's do it. run. Um, my biggest concern here was we had a moving vehicle with two machine guns strapped to it. What could go wrong? What could go wrong? Uh, well, there's a lot of things that could go wrong. Triggering mechanisms might not work. Uh, Terry's got to drive with one hand as well as trigger the firearms. Uh, what if we got a flat tire while the car was moving? What if the car tipped over? We've got cameramen all around and everything, so we had a lot of danger zones. So that was one that had me kind of worried, but as you can see, it, it turns out pretty well. And this is one of those, this is one of the ones where I actually got to be with Larry while I was, you know, engaging those weapons. If you guys know James Bond, uh, Goldfinger and a bunch of the earlier ones, he has that, you know, the Aston Martin DB5, which is impossible to do this for real. But by the way, I got to drive a real Aston Martin DB5 around Burbank, which was pretty cool. We couldn't, wow. they wouldn't let us put machine guns on it for some reason. <laughs> Party poopers. But the idea of us was to prove what's it like to have two guns on the side of a vehicle that you actually have a converging point. And could what's you even like? aim while could you were actually driving? Aim? Could you actually I mean, estimate the range while you're driving and, and hit it? And by the way, we were wildly successful on this one. Yeah. I think everyone was happy with this one. We have a really great team. It's not just it's just as Larry. We've got uh, Andre Ellingson, Tom Seymour, and, and uh, um, a bunch of guys that come in and, and do different things. We. Come on, I got to drive a Range Rover and shoot machine guns out. I also want to say what's helpful, uh, and, I, and, and Larry, we give each other crap all the time, but I, I come from a background of planning training. You know, when you're a Special Forces guy, you have a 12-man A-team, and as a team sergeant, a senior enlisted guy, with my, when along with my commander, we have to plan the training calendar, and we have to run, you know, I, I can assign anybody on a team to run range, you know, but we have to, we have to, we have to plan, advise, and conduct very realistic, live fire training all the time because you don't, that's part of our job. We, everything we do is real, it's live, am I right, Mitch? And it's all, it's dangerous. The training itself is dangerous, but we build in risk assessments and ways to think about, okay, how can we mitigate that risk? And with Larry, he does this all the time as, as the armor, head armor on these movies. So this isn't something he and I haven't done. And then we're, together, I mean, we're, we're, we are a good team because we'll actually talk uh, right before the big, right before we pull the trigger, we'll just do, one more review and talk about, okay, we got that. Yep, this is good. I feel good about this. If this happens, do this. That kind of makes our writer Dan go into orbit sometimes because at the last minute we change the whole script. But it all comes out well in the end, I think. Yeah, and Danny's, Danny's one of the funniest guys. Without him, we, we wouldn't have a show. Yeah. Let's talk about season two. Yes, what, season two. So what can we look forward to in season two? I just, it's more of the same, but I think even more pumped up. I think some of the tests. Definitely stepped up, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely stepped up. I feel like it's just bigger. Um, we have, you know, like I said, we have Tom Selleck and Gary Sinise are in, the, in this one, Nick Searcy from Justified. Uh, I just think we, we just continue to run with what it was in the first season, I think, that made it good. And so we're I think you'll see that the tests are a lot more complicated as well. Yeah, the, they are. The stunts that we're trying to replicate are, are significantly harder. More moving parts. Uh, my, yeah. Many more moving parts, um, and hopefully you'll enjoy it. Yeah. Do you have this big, long wish list of, oh, I remember this scene that I want to do. Or, or, how do, how do yeah, you come up with these ideas? Excellent question. So one of the things, if you ever watch the show, if you get a chance to watch it, at the end of it, I always ba basically say, so if you're like me and you have insomnia and you're watching a movie or a TV show, and you think, can you do that? Reach out to OutdoorChannel.com, Hollywood Weapons, and give us an idea. So 
uh, viewer feedback, people who watch this, we, for second season, the first episode we filmed and the first one that's going to premiere, I guess, in February is the Quigley Down Under episode with Tom Selleck because that half the people, I mean, a lot of people responded, half of them said, you got to do this and this from Quigley. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay, we'll do it. I mean, there was some guy out there asking me to like outrun an explosion, which I thought was kind of rude because I'm like, <laughs> really, man? I mean, you, yeah, that's not nice. But if, if, if it's doable, if it's, if it's something we haven't seen and if it's something that Larry, we scrub it, we talk about, hey, is this even feasibly doable with safety, we'll, we'll do it, man. If you guys got ideas, just throw it at us. So Larry, once again, is the voice of reason with those Always the voice of reason. Yeah. Yes. Any concerns about any of these uh, upcoming tests we're going to see, Larry? Well, there's, there's, like I said, there's always concerns. Literally, yeah. I, I have butterflies in my stomach huh. every time we do something. Um, but the, the harder tests with, like, water tanks, um, the, the reindeer games test is going to be a very difficult one or was a very difficult one. Um, and I think the underworld one will be very difficult as well, uh, again, because of the fact that we don't really know what the outcome will be. And that's part of the coolness of the show, but that's, that's the major concern of the show, too. Um, and me and John talk about it a lot, and it, it is one of these deals where people come up with ideas, and we don't choose and say, oh, no, we're not going to do that because that'll be too dangerous. We go about it trying to figure out how can we do that right. and do it in a safe mm -hmm. way. So I hope that comes across in the show. What keeps me awake is because it's... I know I'm in very good hands with Larry as far as the safety stuff. I mean, we, and we work on that together, but Larry's the final arbiter and I trust him. For me, it's the ones that make, make me lose sleep are the ones that have a lot of skill involved where it's like, man, I can't suck. You know what I mean? I gotta, I, I, I gotta do good here. So some of the shots I've taken that were like, I'm like, oh boy, I, we don't fake them. If I get it, I get it. If I don't, I don't. So what about a dream character? Is there one out there for you that you're like, I really have to wear that with? Yeah, okay. So, first of all, me being Kate Beckinsale is a dream which is about to come true. I'll let you know how it goes. We'll all stay in touch. Um, the other one I'd like to do, if we get, get more, I'd, I'd like to do something from like a, because I'm going to be 52 here in a couple weeks, so I grew up with the 70s cop shows. So I would love to do something from like Kojak, it would nice. be cool to have the ball, yeah. right? You know, yeah. who loves your baby? And, yeah. Or Starsky and Hutch or Mannix or one of those uh, old school cop shows. I want to I do some more of those kind of TV shows that I grew up with, maybe SWAT or, you know, the old SWAT show. So what about you, man? What, what do you, you'll do what I ask you to do, won't you? <laughs> no, he won't. He never does. I think you got that the other way around, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> you'll do what I tell you to I do. I just want to make myself feel I, better. I, that's honestly, all. I mean, for me, again, you know, Terry's going out and getting dressed up as all these characters. I'm just doing my job. I do this every day, you know, on big film productions, except this time I'm doing it in front of the camera. But as far as characters go, for me personally, there, there's a hole in my heart that I didn't get to be Q in in you know, <sighs> James Bond, uh, and I kept telling uh, Danny, I, I wanted the white lab coat. I wanted you, you know, would have been great to be too. in the lab and everything, and they just didn't didn't allow uh, me. To well, do that. I will say this though, I won't give it away because there's a big surprise coming up in one of the episodes where Larry's going to be a huge piece of it. He's, there's a lot to this guy, and there's a piece of the show that we didn't know he was he was as good as he was at something. Mm. I, I don't want to give it away. I mean, I, I'm just saying. I just say he's a he's a he's a black belt in a very very specific Japanese martial art it has to do with drawing and cutting swords and so we happen to be testing a sword so you'll be okay both of you have met some really cool people yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you know you, you that's life Tom isn't Selleck, it Tom Selleck life I mean, is, but life really, is meeting cool people actually yeah but what was that like really it was fun I I I I learned quickly I got lucky you know. It, Going to the special forces thing again, we go overseas, you know, Green Rays especially, we, we're, we learn foreign languages, we learn culture. I've been, I've had a talk, interview, arbitrate tribal disputes with people who are, I don't speak their language that well. And so I'm used to doing that. I think that, that helps a lot actually, because you're in front of a group of people that, so with this case, it's just all I, I've, when I started doing Warriors and doing different TV shows, I've always told people, hey man, I'm not gonna interview you. This isn't an interview, it's a conversation. I think it makes a big difference because the interview is just like, so dude, were the Spartans really mean? No, I mean, I, I, every time I talked to somebody when I was doing Warriors, for example, I, uh, I talked to Paul Cartledge, who's the chair of classics at Cambridge. So he, this, this guy knows everything you could possibly imagine about Greek culture and the Spartans. I read all his books 
and I already knew a lot of stuff. So that way when I talked to him, it wasn't, I wasn't asking him dumb questions. I was, but I, I told him, he was kind of nervous. I said, don't be nervous, man. We can suck. The editors will make us look better. Just, it's two, no, seriously, it's two guys that are interested in a topic. I just want to talk to you. And I think if you look at it that way, it becomes not an interview, it becomes a conversation, and it's way more interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you pinch yourself sometimes thinking, I mean, I mean, you can go back 20 years and go, did I ever, ever even picture myself being here right now? Yeah, no, you never know where you're going to end up. You know, I, like, like I said, I originally got out of the Army to be a classical actor on stage. What, what, what happened? You know, the war started. I'm back in there and I'm doing other things. But, you know, I, I'm very grateful for this. It's, it's, a, it's like I said, I, I segued right from retiring. A lot of guys get jammed up when they leave the military, especially what we do, because it's very intense very uh, clannish and we're very family it's a tight family but you know I walked right into filming another you know another project that we're that we're still working on so uh, every day I get up man I I, I try to be grateful because some guys you know guys aren't here I, I actually have a really good story about that um, there's an author named Barry Eisler who writes a series of books they're kind of like a born identity uh, mm -hmm. series of books and the character in his books is this professional military kind of secret agent assassin. And in one of the books, he's actually kind of lamenting to himself that he wants to get out of the business. He's 43 years old, he's tired of doing this, but what do you do when you leave that world yeah. and just decide to start a new career? And he goes, you know, the lucky ones get a job at a security business doing risk assessment and stuff like that. The really lucky ones get a job in Hollywood blowing stuff up and shooting guns all the time and teaching actors how to do it. And I was reading that and it was like, that's us, yeah, you know. I mean, and we're fortunate enough to be able to use that background again in an entertaining way that hopefully brings pleasure to other people. Because when we talked earlier this week, you guys said this is not really about weapons. No. Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't, no, it's not, yeah, that's, it's not. It's called Hollywood Weapons, and there's guns in it, but I think it's, uh, I'd like to think it's much more interesting than that. There's enough gun stuff in there. If you're a gun wonk, and you're, a, and you're really interested in weapons, you're going to learn, you'll, you'll be like, yep, cool, you'll learn something, but it's not just driven by that. I think yeah, it's, I mean, yeah. for me personally, I hope that what comes across is the back behind the camera work yeah. that goes into this. If you're interested in how you make movies and how you make television shows, hopefully you see that in this show. It's not about the weapons. It's not about his wigs, for sure. It's about how yeah, you produce a show though. and you do it safely. Well, one other thing, too. It's important. This is important. I've, I've talked about this before. The goal of the show is not to say, is not to debunk Hollywood. No. Come on. What, that, that, what kind of party, what kind of Debbie Downer buzzkill would that be? I, I, it's... We're not sitting there going, oh, Predator's BS. No, it's, we're actually sort of paying homage to it and, and celebrating it and having fun with it. So even if it doesn't work as well as we thought it would, or if I don't, I'm not able to do it that time for that, what we expect, I won't sit there and go, ah, oh, you know, Die Hard's bullshit. I'll say, you know what? I didn't do it so well, but, you know, Bruce Willis playing John McClane could. Well, the thing, the we thing to remember is it's a movie. And it is a movie. It's not right. for real. It's a movie. You know? so. so if we don't manage to duplicate it, it's like, hey, it's a movie. Yeah, we, and we have fun doing it. And there are times, there's a few times. I, I will say, it's something else, too, is like a lot of the stuff we, we tested as well as we could. I mean, really putting like these real, a, a real gun from, you know, the 1870s. That's what I'm really using. I'm really, uh, there's, no, I'm not, there's nothing fixing this or faking it. I got to take this shot at a rope with, uh, you know, not much, to, not much to go on. If I make it, I make it. If I don't, it's still okay, you know, because we still, it's the fun of doing it, and it's uh, always, I always, it's never about tearing down the movie or, or saying, oh, that's not real, because, uh, what? No, it's fun, you know, and, and most, a lot of the stuff actually worked, don't you think? Like, a lot of stuff we've done, I think we were a bit surprised on some of the, some of the crap we did. I was like, how'd that work, man? So, you know, when you're making a movie, like uh, even Star Wars, which is a science fiction type movie, there's got to be something that's grounded in reality so that the viewers actually see it and go, yeah, that's believable. I think if you were really good, that could really happen. Right. And we're actually proving that that's true. Yeah. Is there something in season two that you're really excited about the viewers seeing? Him dressed up as Kate Beckinsale. <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty excited. Uh, he keeps coming back to Kate. What's well, that Well, I mean, he keeps talking about it, so. That's, I'm really exposed myself on this yeah. panel. Uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm excited for you guys to see the Quigley Down Under episode because those were some pretty difficult shots. And, uh, 
I got pretty lucky. Um, I think the reindeer games one. Is and the reindeer games one was, was shooting shotguns. That was shotguns. probably our most difficult day on set ever, and it, it's come out really, it's really good. It's unbelievable how yeah. it turned out. But it was one of those, because you were thinking we're dealing with five-inch slabs of ice. It's warm outside. We have a huge tank. We got these guys put together a rack, this awesome rack of heavy metal with, with shotguns that could be activated by pulling levers, a string, so that it... And, it was under the ice at a specific distance, just like in the movie, and it was just so much to go. And we're, you know, time's ticking, the ice is starting to melt, but where do you see that episode? It was, it was nuts. Yeah. And I know you two like to talk about the crew because there's so many people involved in, in getting yeah, the production done. Yeah, we're just a small done. piece so, of it, yeah. So tell us a little bit more, more about how, that, how the crew comes into play and in, when, you're, when you're doing some of these tests. I, well, I would say... Uh, for the guys we have on the show, our camera guys, Joe Movic, uh, Brooke Aiken, these guys are pros. I mean, they, these aren't guys that just don't have anything to, to input into what we're doing. They're, we all talk about how this can go, what they need to do, what they're going to need to get, that kind of thing. Our sound guy, uh, uh, Tim is our usual sound guy. We have a new guy coming in now. Everybody, who's work, everybody who works on the show, we don't have a big crew, but everybody has a lot of fun. We make sure you have a lot of fun if you come work with us. And... Um, it has to be that way. I think I, I can't imagine being working on a show where like someone in the cast is just a jerk or it, difficult to work with because you want everybody to root for you and you know you need everybody's maximum effort, especially on that day with the, the Ranger Games. Yeah, it was I just mean one of those the days. reality is that you don't get to see everything that happens behind the camera, but especially on a show like this where you're dealing with live fire weapons and whatnot, the sound guy has to be knowledgeable enough about guns to know right. where he can and cannot be and, and things like that. So the entire crew from start to finish are, are dedicated professionals. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they weren't, we're going to replace them and we're going to get somebody else. But uh, we have the best crew, the best production uh, for me personally, yeah, so fun. having dealt with larger productions, this is bar none the nicest production group I've ever worked with. Everybody's professional, and I think it comes through in the show. We Josh, our editor, is here too. He's this big, tall, scary guy over there. He's, <laughs> I, oh, yeah, I the crew's professional, Not and then scary. there's Josh. I, I apologize to him every day. I go, I'm so sorry you have to look at me <laughs> every day. We have some time that we can uh, take some questions from the audience, so yeah. if anyone wants to... You know, we ain't scared of you. Yeah, if you have a question, we can't see you, by the way. So, yeah, go ahead, shout it out. So, you'll you'll be next, and we'll get you there. Yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was not a set. That was the enterprise. We were on the enterprise. I don't even know what you're yeah. talking about, man. So, <laughs> we we we, we try to bring us down. It was amazing. So picture this. So we got to. If you guys are familiar with the first, uh, you know, first iteration of Star Trek with Captain Kirk and, and uh, uh, William Shatner, which is the one I grew up with, there's an episode where Kirk gets put on this planet. He has to take down this, the Gorn, the Lizard Man. You ever, you ever know what I'm talking about? You ever seen that one? Classic. And he builds the cannon. But there, we did everything. We choreographed the awful combat with him. Uh, we were at Vasquez Rock where there's iconic shots. And there's a guy who built in Ticonderoga, New York. I'm from New York, actually, from New York City, but... He built this thing in upstate New York. It is the exact, I mean, it's crazy. He built the Enterprise. He built yeah. the Enterprise set to the, to the smallest plastic piece. It's all, off, it's all exactly what you would expect. And uh, the, the bridge, uh, the transporter room, everything. So we were actually working on the Enterprise for a few days. So and, funny. I mean, for me, as the gun guy, right, I got to hold a real phaser. How, <laughs> how much better could you get than that, right? And we got to beam Larry up. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Come on. You can use that line of cocktail parties. That's right. Yes. <laughs> That's a good one. I like the way you think. <laughs> but it was really great. Like, that was, again, an unexpectedly crazy cool thing that we got to walk. And they had to hold tours there. And the, the people there, they're all obviously, obviously Trekkies, passionate Star Trek people. They were so much fun to be around because, they were, again, they're passionate about that, about that, uh, that topic. And we've, we, were, we, were on the, we were on the Enterprise. It was amazing. Very cool. All right. We had another question. You, you have one there, yeah. sir? Excellent question. Yes, we never let that go, man. Um, there's at least one time in that show, even when we're having fun, I'll turn to the audience. I say, Dude, "Don't try this at home. This is this is a classic. This is this is a professional group of people." I, I think he might have been asking that question to the gun guy, Terry. Oh, <laughs> but it's all about me, isn't it? 
Yeah, no, it's not. Go ahead, Larry. Larry. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, we always we, we always try the the, uh, the question was about promoting gun safety rules. I think we always push that we we talk a lot about safety, you know, when we're doing these different uh, things. But again, it's not about the weapons. It's not a gun show. Um, it's just about getting through it in in one piece. But we take that seriously. Yeah, you'll never see seriously. you'll never see me flag somebody with a muzzle. You'll never see you'll never see that because we won't. Do and we it. thank our editors for that. Yeah, but we, but no, because you know obviously guns are. Guns are a hot topic in the country right now. We get it, right? So um, we, don't, we don't goof around about that. We have a lot of fun when it's time to have fun, but when that's the weapons test are there, we, we look right at the audience and go, don't try this at home. This is, this is serious business. So, yeah, we do. Anybody else? Did Mike Malazzo make it here, my buddy from the 82nd Air Force? Oh, there you are. There's another Army, but he and I are in the Gulf War together. Y'all are welcome for your freedom. <laughs> Matea right now. Fellow, fe my fellow ranger buddy. That's good to be coming and seeing old guys we, I serve. Who else? Who wants to know something? No? Yeah, okay, I guess they want oh, to know. Did... Yeah. That's fun. You know, Mike Simpson I know very well, actually. I got Mike signed with my agency because when he got hunting Hitler, you know, you were going to come up. Yeah. I, know, I know Tim Kennedy. I've met him peripherally. I don't, I don't know him very well. But, yeah, I mean, we're, we're all follow each other. Uh, we're all in communication. I, I think it's less – maybe I'm I, – I look at it this way. I've hooked a lot of guys up in my community who could potentially take work from me. But I look at it like, you know, their success is my success. Um, and there's – you know, look, I'm an old guy at this point. Some jobs I'm not going to be good for, you know, you want the young stud. But I think there's always some of that. But I think in general, if you look in the special forces community, we, we, we generally pull for each other. Yeah. And not just special forces, infantry, Marines, everybody. We're all, we're, those are the guys. I, and, I, and I will say personally, everything I've done on television, if I can keep that uh, military audience happy, then I've succeeded. Because if I let them down... Uh, then I've really failed. And there's been some projects in the past I've turned down. I was like, I'm not going to do it because it doesn't reflect well on, on what I do and what the unit is about. So. And you do hear from your audience members, don't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, we, they, have they have basic open access to us, yeah. which is good and bad. I've, we had some pretty interesting ones like, ah, Terry sucks. Why is he blah, 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 blah. <laughs> And it hurt my heart. I promised I wouldn't do that again, OK, Terry? I I mean... <laughs> yeah, and I found out it was Larry. <laughs> nice. But it is nice to hear from the audience. I mean, they do call in. They, they ask us questions. Where did you get that jacket? Where did you find that hat? And it, that tells us that they're actually paying attention to every single frame of the show that we put on. So I hope that means that they like it. Yeah. And it's, it, it, that's, the audience is a big part of what we're doing. Because, you know, if you want to see it done, man, let us know. We'll, we'll give it a whirl. Anybody else? Anybody else? Another question? Bueller? No, not at all, man. I can't, what do you say? He, he asked, how does Hollywood, on a technical this, uh, level, get the weapons to cycle with blanks? Um, a lot of trial and error, okay? Um, and I don't say that jokingly. Uh, every single weapon is different. If you're familiar with a blank fire adapter or BFA that they use in the military, it's this big orange thing that sits <laughs> on the outside of the gun. Uh, we can, of course, do that in Hollywood. Um, because we're pretending that we're shooting live rounds. So we've invented entire technologies uh, based around blank firing. We have our own blank firing or blank manufacturing company uh, where we can tailor the loads to the specific guns. And every single gun is a challenge. Every design is different. Um, and we have to invent that as we go along. Um, now, there's some guns that are just unblankable, you know. Um, and we come up with other alternatives, like we disguise certain guns. Um, back in the day when the P90 was not yet available, you'll actually see a lot of Hollywood productions that they're MAC-10s with shells built around them to make them look like P90s. So there is a certain element of movie magic when you're dealing with other productions. With what we do here, it's the real stuff, like Terry was saying. If he's supposed to be shooting a you know, an 1873 Colt or a Civil War percussion cap weapon, that's what, that's shooting. what he's shooting. Yeah. So in some ways, this show is even more complicated than the biggest Hollywood production you could think of. That's a good question, though, dude. You had one back there, brother? I don't need that. 
He doesn't need that. That's nice of you, though, Josh. That's big Josh, by the way. <laughs> Right. Yeah. <laughs> How about watching a movie where they pull out a Glock and there's actually a hammer on it that they cock back? Yeah. 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 My wife won't go to movies with me anymore because of that. When I, when I watch <laughs> things and I keep getting upset, but. You know, it's really a, a lot of times, and, and this is upsetting to me as someone who gets the credit as the armorer on some of these shows. You know, you want it to be authentic, and people will look at that and say, oh, look, the armorer didn't know what he was doing. Well, most of us do, but it's there for dramatic effect. Yeah. The director's telling a story. He doesn't really care, you know, that the Glock doesn't have a hammer. He doesn't even know what the hammer does on a gun. So it, if they build something like that in... Um, there's a reason, uh, excellent example of it was um, when we did Django Unchained, uh, Quentin Tarantino wanted an over and under Derringer on the wrist gag, if you remember, Christoph Schultz shoots out the, this little kind of wild, wild west uh, kind of gun. And we go down and we do a show and tell where we lay out all the guns, and I, I bought that gun for him because he asked for it, but I had to tell him that the gun is 10 years too late. It didn't exist during the time period of the movie, per his script. You know, it, it, the movie opens up somewhere in Texas in 1858, and that gun didn't exist until 1868. And he listened to me while I explained that to him, and he said, thank you very much for telling me I'm making entertainment, I'm not making history. <laughs> and he goes, in the last movie I made, I killed Hitler, and that didn't happen either, you know. So... Um, as long as you know that going into it, that it's just a movie, it's, it's easier to handle. Um, it doesn't bother me that much, man, actually, believe yeah. it or not. I'm, you, I'm sure I'm, of that. I'm less, upset yeah. about, I'm less upset about it than you would think. I see it and I go, unless it's egregious, you know, egregious, or it's like something... We that, gun professionals are very upset when we <laughs> see stuff like that. I just, I go, ah, it's a movie, man. It's okay. It's a good question, though. Anybody else? What do you got there, bud? On our show, we don't do CGI. Yeah, no, we don't do it. We don't no. do it. No. Yeah, John, it is John Carter, our director. Do we have a budget constraint? <laughs> we have a very big budget. Yeah, we're always fighting that battle. Uh, but like, okay, so for the Jaws episode, we'll just talk about that. So, I, you know, I'm a scuba guy. If you, any, anybody who knows anything would would know that a tank of compressed air, just compressed air is not going to do what it did to the movie in Jaws when it blows up. It's just not going to happen. But, and we knew that, but so we tested a couple things where we rigged up a mast and I had to lay on my side with the, with the M1. And I'm a lefty, so it was a really crappy position for me. And we had a, a shark on a, on a moving uh, dolly out at the range, so it was on wheels. It was coming at me and vibrating and moving, and it had the tank in its mouth. So the sh f first test was, see, can you hit it? And I did. I was able to get a couple shots in on it. But then the next thing once with, with the air tank... It, all it did was actually, if, if I remember right, it, it punctured it. I did. I was able to hit it from a distance safely, and it just spun this big shark around. Yeah. Because the air was being released rapidly, but it wasn't exploding. So we're like, that was fun, but it wasn't dramatic. So then we tweaked it so that the next time I shot that, the whole thing blew up. And we explained that. you know. So it's like we, we always want to end on a up note. Yeah. If we can. And to answer, to take that answer one step further, the more of you who call in or, or send, you know, comments to the outdoor channel and show an interest in the show, the bigger our budget gets. So, <laughs> we, yeah. you know, we're just, just saying, shamelessly just you know. appealing to your, just, just, yeah. Are you going to give out the phone number while we're here? Just we can. Kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> just call us later. Another question? Anybody else? Anybody else? It's a fun show, guys. If you haven't seen it, I promise you, you'll dig. You'll, you'll definitely laugh. Uh, yes, there's someone over there. Yeah, 
Yeah, well, it's, it's definitely changed. Uh, I think it, years ago, I think the gun stuff that you saw on film was just basically uh, perpetuated and institutionally done by Hollywood people who really didn't know that much about guns. So hence, you have people shooting a gun like this, or, right? I mean, that, no, we, no one shoots that way. I think over time, it's gotten a little bit, there's a lot more technical advisors. We've been at war for a long time, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of cops that are doing real world stuff. So I think that's helped uh, the quality of what you see, the weapons handling. Um, and as far as the old movies, yeah, you're just never gonna get away from that. That's how they did it. But. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the movies too. You know, if you look at some of the late 1940s, early 1950s movies like Battleground and things like that, most of the actors were actually in World War II vets. and they're, they were vets. <laughs> yeah, and when they're setting up a 30 cal, they knew what they were doing. Yeah. We're seeing a little bit of that now, again, with technical advisors and people who are coming back from some of the current conflicts the level of what's being expected is, is much higher. It's higher, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Very cool. Anybody else? No, no nothing we've ever shown is, is uh, not open source, you know. Yeah, I, I don't think anything we've ever done is classified and you can get a lot more of this information uh, over the internet. Um, so I don't think we're giving any. I actually did away. a show called Close Quarter Battle. I filmed it in Prague, and it was all about CQB and you know, clearing buildings and stuff. I made sure uh, there were a couple things they wanted me to do. I was like, I'm not doing that because that's not really. That's one of our TTPs, meaning it's something that we use that we don't, you know, spread. But everything else, everything I did on there, I made sure that it was open source. You could find it on the internet, you know. So yeah, I, we're we, I, we're never going to show anything that would compromise what my guys do out in the woods and, or in combat it ain't happening no anybody else watch the damn show i promise you'll laugh in fact <laughs> we have a question well, in the back right there here here we go right well, that makes sense by the way that that's a normal thing Yeah. Right. Oh, well, thank you. I, that makes me happy. I mean, that's that's that. Re honestly, having someone like you dig the show really is our goal. It is. I mean, because it's yeah. So that makes me. Yeah. That makes that, me happy. That's fantastic. That's, that's, I, that you, that, that's the best compliment we could get. Actually. Tim's down here somewhere. He's the guy who created the show, actually. So if Tim heard that, I, I hope he's happy. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, that's, that's, if, we can get to, if we can get to you. Yes. <laughs> he, owes you a, he owes you a couple of, whatever you're, whatever you're drinking, doll. He'll get it for you. Well, listen, we have a clip about season two. So let's have a look, so you can be ready for season two. Oh. I can't believe you shot me. I can't believe it either. You're quite certain, Mr. Quigley, that you wouldn't like the bucket a bit closer. You'll be using this Aston Martin DB5 modifications. It's a 564-yard shot. Unbelievable! We're testing James Bond. What did we learn today? You actually get two guys. That's called a Quigley, so... Is it? Yes! And I gotta grow a mustache. An impossible shot that only I could make. Thank you, Tom. I'll do my best. Pretty darn good, man. <laughs> We're testing justified. We've got the vehicle prepped. We've got a dummy. Don't. Shoot through the dead body. Bullets got to go through about 10 feet and kill another bad guy. We're testing reindeer games. He used the shotgun to blast through the ice and escape. Could that even happen? We got three shotguns. We've got a piece of ice five inches thick. Well, this one's going to really roast his chestnuts. Now I have seen everything. 
Awesome. Don't try this at home. How could you not watch that? <laughs> How could you not watch that? If you don't watch that, you're not American. Damn it. So season two begins February 25th on the Outdoor Channel. Big round of applause for Terry and Larry, please. Uh, thank you, too, by yep. the way. That was My great. Pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks, name is up, thanks for putting up with us. Thanks for, thanks for joining, everybody. Appreciate it. And actually, we'll, we, we will be downstairs. Yeah, in come that bug us. little social area, so come hang out yeah, with us for a bit. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate thank it. you very much. Hey, look over there. All right.